the recording. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm sitting here with um, my friend Ian, who is still knocking the cobwebs out of his brain. <laughs> I think we all are doing that to varying degrees. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just chatting every now and then about what's coming up for us and what's um, what we're seeing in the world and what seems to be triggering people. And, um, and so today we were just chatting about what do we see? What's, what seems to be upsetting right now? And what I'm, what I'm witnessing um, in the connections that I have is that there's a lot of uh, people who are unemployed and who are really worried about how they're going to recover financially from being unemployed. And there's a lot of red tape that people are having to move through in order to get resources. Um, <clears throat> you know, unemployment money and business loans and, and things that are supposed to be helping us right now. And uh, so Ian and, I were, Ian and I were talking about, well, that's kind of a deep topic to go into, <laughs> for sure. However, um, I think we have an opportunity perhaps to redefine, you know, what does it mean to live um, abundantly, to to have a rich and abundant life, to connect to um, something where we feel like we're living well in a wealthy way um, that doesn't necessarily depend on green money, made up, made up economy, made up currency, right? Um, so, you know, I'm curious, what does living a rich, abundant life mean to you? Well, be a little bit different for me than other people. Um, I'm, I'm a true defined minimalist. So I have like three pairs of shorts and a handful of shirts and yeah. two pairs of shoes. And that's about, that's about my, my wardrobe. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of things, uh, things that I have, you know, I, my computer is six years old and I still use it. Um, uh, the only thing I update is my phone or, you know, I have Netflix, you know, paying for things, um, random, random obscurities that I'll, I'll put my money into, uh, it's more education or, uh, mm -hmm. and so for me, uh, abund the abundancy is to live a full life of being able to explore, being able to um, spend moments and times with friends and loved ones where you can laugh and have deep conversations or, or amazing memories. Mm. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's, it's less about where the money goes and more about the experience with the person. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there are people though, out there that I have some very good friends that, you know, they want, like the one thing that kills them right now is they can't go to a restaurant and have a nice meal and um, enjoy that moment or go to a bar and drink with their friends. Um, and so there's, there's a, uh, it, I guess it just depends on, on who you are and, and what you find important. But, you know, when this first started, uh, quite a few people like, they went through their finances and they canceled this and that and they prepared themselves. And there are other people that were looking at what the, uh, what they're reading on the news and, and what they were hearing directly. And so it's catching them a little bit more, uh, faster off guard because mm -hmm. they um, were expecting something to, uh, something to happen or for someone to save them. Yeah. A rescuer. <laughs> so maybe looking at it from that perspective with those mm -hmm. that are caught up within that time frame that they were expecting that help, um, because they weren't looking internally upon themselves and saying, I need to do this and I need to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I sat with that too um, for several weeks. I think my initial reaction to this whole thing was, wow, um, you know, what will happen if I don't have a practice and Noah doesn't have a practice for weeks? Um, you know, there's a lot of people that um, you know, we've got a lot of rent to pay. Um, we've got, a, there's a lot of things that you pay for when you own a clinic, a ton of things. <laughs> and so not wanting to, um, lose those things. 
And I think where Noah and I eventually came, came to is, well, this is all, all of these things are out of our control. There's only so many practical things that we can do to try to um, mitigate this. And we've done them. We've done what we could. You know, we applied for the small business loan. We've innovated in our business so that, you know, we're still able to see people online and we've done whatever we could. And we've, you know, we've eliminated the expenses that were un unnecessary. But at the end of the day, like, that's, that's all you can really do right now. And, and all of us are in this place of like, we have no idea when the economy is going to get better. <laughs> we have no idea when we're going to be able to work again. We have no idea what's going to happen. So I think there's a choice to be made here um, emotionally and, and psychologically about are we going to um, sit in this unknown in a sense of uh, helplessness or are we going to sit in this unknown in a sense of hope and faith that things will turn around? Because when you look historically, they do. Things but turn around. There, I mean, so there's a few different things when it comes to that. So one is we're both coming from an entrepreneurial perspective. We're both mm -hmm. business owners. So like, I, haven't, I haven't had a boss since, technically I haven't had a boss since I was 21, I think. Mm -hmm. I've always for myself um, mm -hmm. and so I I for a short time I, I you know I've, I've done contracting bits where I've worked with someone and so I've gotten a paycheck and, but I was still on my own and I didn't really have to deal with being told what to do I just showed up for work I did what I what I, what I knew what to do and and uh, I got to go off but there are people who are employed right now that are dealing with unemployment, they got laid off because like uh, my father owns a restaurant in LA. And so all his employees for a short time, he had to lay them off because he couldn't, he couldn't uh, afford to pay them. And so right. with this business loan, hopefully they'll be able to bring them back and, and they can continue paying them and, and they can pay the rent. And so, you know, being a, a server or a cook, um, being uh, one of the providers that's providing the food for, for those people, you know, when you get laid off because you're not, you don't have anyone to, to, drive the truck to drop the food off to right that becomes that that's a different issue so mm -hmm. you have a different fear because you are relying on someone else to have that control to have that leadership that no longer does because they can't there's no one bringing them money because you're you know you go you show up for work you are an employee it's a different mindset it's a different perspective in life mm. um, than a business than the business owner itself and so i think that there's a different type of fear that they're dealing with than or uncertainty or unknown that they're dealing with because they can't go out and find another job um, unless you're going to go work for Amazon, or, <laughs> uh, go work for uh, the grocery stores, uh, Costco, but those places are hiring right now. So when it yeah. comes to something like that, you can always pivot and change and uh, turn towards another direction. You know, for a short time, like myself, I was, I was like, okay, I can't work here. I've got a couple options. I can focus my efforts on back into my education and just hope this, this runs out, or I can potentially just get a job driving food around in my car mm -hmm. and dropping it off to people. And this is a short-term gig. I don't need to, to like stress about making small amounts of money or whatnot, but the, the bigger fear of why I didn't do that is because in the end, I am a business owner, so my job is to or my, my thought process is how do I make this work for me? And mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I help people in this time um, as well as build a new business in this mindset? But not a lot of people can sure. get to that, that point. And then I think the other, the other part is, is um, uh, a lot of conversation is pointing blame and people are, they're angry and they're frustrated, but they don't know, like you can't say, I hate you virus. And so there's, like in China right now, there's uh, something that is eventually going to get to America. It's already gotten here a little bit. Um, it's been here for a while, but it'll, it'll resurge again, I think. is In China, it was reported that a lot of the Chinese have been banning uh, Africans from going into restaurants as well as kicking them out of their homes because they are blaming them for bringing the virus to them. 
they're saying it was Africa that brought it to China. And eventually that is going to hit here where, and people have already done that. There have been a few cases, like there was a woman who, uh, who, who was a friend of a friend. She gives food to the homeless and she happens to be Chinese, um, and, but she's from here. And so as she was uh, hanging off, the homeless actually turned against her. She was bringing food to them and, and, and passing it out. And they started spitting at her and telling her to get the hell out of there, using much more foul language than that mm -hmm. uh, because of her race. And that's going to get even worse and worse because, again, if you're an employee, you've lost your job, you are scared, scared to hell, uh, you cannot do anything like you feel hopeless and and, and uh, like everything's been taken away from you. Again, lack of control we were talking about previously. Mm -hmm. You have this hatred and frustration that it's gonna build up and you wanna point it somewhere else. Yeah. And so- It's easier if there's something to point it at. Someone to point it at. Some, someone or, you know, people have been talking about this coronavirus as if it's some being that is attacking us and it's the same kind of mentality where people uh say fuck cancer right. like cancer is some kind of um force when it's really just uh confused cells inside of our body but i, I think there's a there's a component when it comes to the economical standpoint looking at how money is associated to our lives and, mm -hmm. um in in that respect of where that point of the fear of the economical downfall and the fear of the lack of leadership and the fear of lack of control, you are now pointing your anger towards someone else or something else. And so that is an underlining aspect that is going to be dealing with everybody. Yeah. Which uh, isn't very helpful. I don't think. No. And so, All and, that does is give your power away to someone else. Right. And again, that exact statement is back into what you started the conversation with. Mm -hmm. Good job tying it together. <laughs> On one cup of coffee. <laughs> it was a quarter cup of coffee, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have a choice right now whether we want to keep our focus external and blaming and feeling angry and raging at the injustices of this whole dynamic, or if we want to be um, working within ourselves, within our homes, within our communities to the best of our abilities to create unification, to create hope, to create a sense of joy and peace and, and togetherness. I think we have that choice every day. Yeah. So ways to get around that, ways to, to calm yourself down, to be able to think clear, to be able to, to pivot, to do what you need to do. Um, obviously, focusing on meditation time, focusing on fun time. Last time we were talking about, mm -hmm. you were you would watch Noah play Zelda for a while or you play your guitar. Mm -hmm. um, myself, I, I immerse myself in studies and, and research. Uh, or I started running again. I haven't ran for maybe four years. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it... it <laughs> It's hard. Um, so something I, I just I just found out. So I potentially had the coronavirus um, in early February. Mm -hmm. uh, I like er, uh, late January, early February. I got sick for about eighteen days, mm. and I had a fluctuation of different types of uh, problems. And I was mm. I just stayed home. I didn't go anywhere. And people were bringing me food because I was I was out. I couldn't couldn't do anything. I thought mm. it was really bad flu and and. Uh, but there were some extra symptoms that I had that I didn't think that weren't associated to the coronavirus. And so I'm like, I didn't have it. I, I had something else. It was way too early before the onset actually happened. Sure. Uh, and then I just found out that actually like, uh, so to be blunt and, and I hope this isn't gross, but uh, I had diarrhea for like uh, five days. Mm -hmm. And that's not part of the, that's not one of the talked about symptoms, but apparently, according to a couple of my colleagues that are doctors that are working in New York and, uh, and in Italy, uh, it's like 40% of the, the cases have it. Yeah. And so actually I had all the markers and I had all the symptoms um, just in different orders than what they claimed that you had it in. Uh, 
And so there is now a conversation about how it, the effect on what happens to your lungs afterward and how they're showing that there is potential long-term damage to the lungs. Mm. So now my new goal during this time frame is to rebuild my lung capacity because I can, I can only run about like eight blocks before I have to stop and, and catch my, and literally I have to stop and like walk it off. Yeah. Uh, and so there is, you know, th there's, there's a little bit of fear in that hearing that there's a little bit of uh, disconcern. Like who did I pass this on to during this time when they were giving me food? Like what, what happens before anything was actually happening? Um, but instead of moving into that state of like, oh crap, what did I do? You know, all these different negative thoughts that I can, I can fall into. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at, well, I, I now have a chance to, to rebuild a specific part of my health that was taken away from me. And I can just focus on driving that down. And so three times a week now I'm going out for runs and, and, you know, I've set together a program for myself and put the structure down together to make sure that I'm doing all those things. So I take, and again, hitting the same nail on the head, taking back that control, finding, finding a structure of what is going to work for me and what I can actually do in this mm -hmm. time. Yeah, I think it's useful. I mean, you're talking about using your masculine energy to help you have structure in your life so that you feel um, grounded and connected and, and organized. And I think that's a really great strategy for a lot of people that, um, you know, this is a very challenging time because we're in constant flux of what we're doing day to day. But I think if we can use that rational mind to help us um, give us set tasks to do and it's it's good to know that even if there is damage that is done to the lungs i mean you and i both know what the human body is capable of right Can yeah regenerate I, and that, itself. Like, permanent damage and i'm like that, that sounds a little bit like bs because i yeah it's not real anyone i was a smoker and i i smoked like a pack and a half a day and i played football and i would you mm -hmm. know my lungs definitely were damaged for a year and a half and I, you know, when I turned 26, I was living in Australia and I was running eight miles a day, every other day, mm -hmm. never had an issue. Um, so I, I know, we know that, that the lung tissue can regrow and bronchial tube and the bronchial tubes actually have the ability to strengthen themselves on their own. All you have to do is train it, you know. You totally, yeah. So, whatnot. so yeah, they're, they're, again, news has a lot of fear they're pushing out. And so yeah, taking, taking detach. <laughs> Taking a logical step, looking at the information, yeah. you know, looking at the signs of things, how things work. It it depends on on you know how much you actually know, but you know reaching out to people like your doctor or health health professionals or health specialists like uh, like uh, strength conditioning coaches or whatnot that actually train people in, in those perspectives. Um, they can definitely help you out with those things. Absolutely, and the other thing is with the coronavirus um, and the diarrhea. I mean. We know from PDTR that the lung and the liver, uh, excuse me, the lung and the large intestine meridian often pair. I'm not surprised if that the body would not cope and, and strategize, excuse me, use a strategy of the large intestine to help mitigate the lung issues. Yeah. Right? From a PDTR, strictly PDTR, like hyper mode yeah. thought process. Yeah. So. So. Let's go, let's go back to the, uh, the original idea we were talking about. When you're being a business owner, being an uh, being employee, someone that is in the state of the fear of the economy, the fear of not being able to have, I, th I think the, the underlining issue when, when you, you were the one that originally brought this topic up, that stuck in my head was, uh, your attachment to things and your attachment to the way of your life, how, mm -hmm. it, how it goes on a consistent basis, not being able to challenge yourself to yourself change properly yep. and health, health in a healthy state, I should say. I well, think one useful process is to think about all the things in your life that you feel are things that you can't live without and challenge yourself about whether that's true or not. So I live in a really big, beautiful house. Do I have to live in a house this big? No. I can live in a much smaller house. I don't have to go out to eat, you know, once or twice a week. I can not go out to eat and eat much cheaper food if I have to. 
I cannot buy an audio book or a, a Kindle book every week. <laughs> I can read some of the books that I haven't gotten to yet. I can go to the library. Read? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I read a lot. Um, oh, my friends make me feel so small when they talk about <laughs> There's so many of my friends that do that. You guys go through a book a week or like a book every three days. I'm like, how do you have the time to do that? Uh, oh, I mean, it, you can I don't do a lot of other stuff. So, I mean, right now I'm not doing anything. <laughs> you just play the background? And you're, like, you're just playing the background? You're just like knitting? What are you doing? Uh, well, audiobooks I usually reserve for driving. So I haven't listened to an audiobook in a long time. Um, so Noah and I will go on like a road trip and we'll listen to a whole audiobook. Um, mostly it's reading. So right now I'm reading a book called God Speaks. <laughs> God Speaks. Yeah, it's written by a, a, uh, actually an Indian sage. Uh, and it's free online. I'm like, hmm. great, I'll save money and just download this thing free. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, you know, comfort that I can find by just literally thinking rationally about everything in my life and thinking about, you know, what would it be like if I had to let go of this thing and really recognizing that I would be fine. I would really be okay. Um, so that's one strategy that I use. Another one is just anytime fear comes up, I just breathe. Just breathe through the fear, however long it takes. Might take 10 breaths, might take five minutes, doesn't matter. Just sitting, sitting with the fear, allowing it to be here, and just breathing. Um, calling up friends, talking to them. I try to avoid that to mostly because um, I don't think, <laughs> I think fear is contagious. So if I'm going to talk to someone about how afraid I am about something, then they're going to feel very afraid most of the time. And then they're going to go have to talk to someone else about how afraid they are. <laughs> it just creates this whole chain. Um, but there are certain friends that I can talk to where yeah. I don't have that impact on them. And, and I, think I can just. That where they know. And also by setting the tone of the conversation beforehand, I think is great. Great way to start that type of scenario. Like I have, there are a few friends I can actually turn to and and vomit my like what was it two days ago, um, I was I was listening to Trump speak and he did something and I was like holy moly and I I was grabbing my head and trying to wrap my head around like why would you do that um, and so I went on this tangent and I called up somebody and I'm like look I have to. I have to spout and I need to spout to somebody. So I just need you to shut up, listen. You don't need to say anything. You don't need to comfort me. I just need mm. to, to regurgitate this information off my chest and my, my frustration with it all. Mm. Um, and then just let it out. And I just need, I need uh, a sounding board for that. And this has nothing to do sure. with you. This is, this is uh, not me attempting to create a, um, a negative output on, on our relationship but mm. but I just I, I need that moment in my life yeah. and setting the boundary setting the tone for what's going to happen and that way mm. when they walk away there's like well he's just angry he's just frustrated that has nothing to do with me yeah I think that's really great to be able to do that and and set the expectation in advance and so otherwise people energetically are going to set themselves up differently so if I know you're coming to me because you need me to, to, to help you heal through something, my energy system is going to be very different than if you're just, I need to vent something out and just listen. I'm going to have a different response in my body and energy field to that. So I think that's really helpful. One of them is going to be very, um, very deeply connected and kind of super in tune with your energy field. And the other one's going to be a little bit more um, held back and boundaried mm. so that I don't, I don't really need to get into all of that. If, it, if you're just trying to open up and get things out, you know what I mean? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. 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 So setting the tone is, I think important when it comes to that type of thing, because it may also make it a safe situation for you and the other person. And it makes it easier yep. for you to actually uh, express what's truly coming out because there's a less, not as big of a fear of judgment, which a lot of people, that's why they stop themselves from actually. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, 
you were speaking about breathing techniques and what do you use? What do you do when, you, when it comes to breathing? Something um, a way to everybody so they can potentially practice this at home today. Okay, well, this is how I really do it. Let me tell you how I really do it. So there's many, many breathing techniques, but what I like to do is I like to imagine that from my root chakra, there's a, a root, like a, a rope, I'm going to write know where the chakras are, what chakras are. Why don't you give a one minute information? <laughs> sure. That yes. Weird. Doesn't everyone know this? No, no. I know. So um, there are seven chakras, which are energy centers in the body. At the base of the spine, at the perineum for, for men, and at the base of the cervix for women, the root chakra, the energy center of the root chakra is um, located. Uh, the sacral chakra is about, you know, sort of mid SI area. Uh, the solar plexus is in your gut. Um, the heart chakra is in the center of your chest. The throat chakra is in your throat. Third eye is right here. Um, and it, it's sort of associated with the pineal gland. And then the crown is in the top of your head. So there are seven energy centers. They work as a system. They work uh, sometimes they're out of balance and that can create um, problems in the body. Um, but the root chakra is where we are connected to the earth. And so intentionally set, having a visualization where you connect to the earth and you ground to the earth can be very powerful in this time. So how you do that is you visualize a rope made out of white light. And you can make the rope look however you want. It can just be a single filament. It can be braided like a rope. doesn't matter. And you picture that rope coming out of the root chakra, so the perineum for men or the cervix for women, right down between the legs, and it travels. You visualize it going all the way down to the center of the earth. So it's this long white rope. And when you do this, this white rope can pull down into the earth any fears, any beliefs, any energies that don't belong to you, anything that's not supposed to be there. It will, the gravity will just pull it down into the earth where the earth, the earth's energies can heal it and process it. So when I breathe and do, when I'm in fear, I breathe in and then I breathe out and allow all the energy to go down into the, to the earth. So I don't really think about like counts or techniques of like in through the nose, out through the mouth, although I tend to like that. That to me doesn't matter as much as where am I sending this energy? I'm focused on releasing it, allowing it to leave my body, helping my body to kind of process this. And it feels quite nice to be grounded into the earth in this way. It's, it's very relaxing. It's soothing. And that's something that you can um, do as a daily practice. Um, your, that cord will stay there for as long as you want it to. It doesn't go away. You can kind of see it in your mind's eye and check in on it every now and then. Build yourself a new one if it gets, starts to look junky. Hmm. So that's an, an ancient energy technique. It's very helpful. Like did that. you make did you make one as I did it? I did. I was I was imagining it as we went. Yeah. Does There's, it go all the way to the earth or what? To the center? Uh, I was more focused on where it was coming out of my body. I was <laughs> playing a game with that actually. <laughs> should it should it look like a tail? Is it look like a long piece of poo? What are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. So to add on to that is you know, I'm, I'm, I know there, there, there are going to be a few people that watch this and be like, this, this nonsense, what are you talking about? This is, there's no science in this. Uh, I think you, you want to look at it from a different interpretation because uh, yeah, there are many different ways, many different cultures uh, of meditation, of releasing energy. Mm -hmm. uh, each one has their own idea, their own process. I think in the end, as long as you have a pathway or a way to let this go as your example is um, this is a form of something that will allow someone to check in with themselves find where they're feeling stress find where they're feeling anxiety tension in their body or in mm -hmm. their in their head 
and the ability to focus on releasing it. Same thing as they teach um, when, it, when it comes to sleep, like thinking of your body and you work, 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 work uh, progressive work, relaxation. Yeah, looking at something to whatever's tight and relax it and then keep working mm -hmm. with it. It's exactly the same thing, you're just doing it from a mental standpoint. You're doing it in a seated position during the daytime. Um, right. So there's definitely validity in, in using these techniques. It doesn't matter where it comes from or what it is, because everything's different for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and try it, uh, play with it, make it your own. It doesn't have to be exactly as, as Jamie was talking about, um, but you, that's your starting point. So it's like a recipe, you know? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to cooking, the recipe is just, it's just a generalized guide. You kind of make it up as you go, add whatever spices to it that you want to make it taste mm -hmm. your own palate. Right. And some people like to imagine instead of a grounding cord coming out of their root chakra, um, roots literally growing out of their feet. Oh, that's interesting. And well, that is another nice way that you can imagine just up. There just needs to be a pathway for the energy to move. A lot of people um, move their bodies as a way to release stress, but then the stress stays in their energy field because they don't know how to get it out of that. They don't have a pathway for that. So this is a really cool, easy way to just imagine the energy releasing all the way from you, not just from your physical body, not just from the tissue. I like that. Yeah. You play with that instead of making a tail. <laughs> right. Um, what are your uh, ending thoughts on this? Uh, my ending thoughts are, you know, as much as you can, try to use your conscious mind, your rational mind to help you sort through, you know, what's true, what's actually happening right now versus what are your fears about what's happening, what's made up. Do as much as you can, simple things every day to keep yourself moving, keep yourself feeling connected to joy, connected to hope. And... Um, just maybe think, have, a, have some time now to rethink about what, what having an abundant, rich life really means to you. Because it's very personal. Like you said, some people have no things. Some people want to have mansions. Some of us are kind of in the middle. Um, but just being willing to be flexible with what that, what that means and have a, give yourself an opportunity to redefine it. The sure. end. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, we will see you next time. Mm.